scenario B and C. So we created, we envisioned additions at those facilities, those existing facilities that could be added on to. So you end up with slightly more than building maintained than scenario B and C. What's really noticeable, however, is that your life cycle costs are dramatically higher, dramatically higher, 632 million over 30 years, compared to the existing scenario, which was 438, and the others, which were around 480 million. That's another 150 million higher. And the reason for that should be easy to understand. We are, you are adding costs everywhere. You are adding additional costs, um, but you are seeing zero operational efficiencies. You are not saving anything from a reduction in buildings maintained, from energy served, or for staff. So you're simply adding to the equation. And so this turns out to be, by far, the most expensive of all the options to be considered. The average educational adequacy doesn't reach the scores of scenario B and C. It doesn't reach into the satisfactory range because you are still using those facilities that pose the greatest challenges to you currently. So your cost-benefit ratio is actually the worst of all of the scenarios that were envisioned. So a school district that was proposing to do this when asked, is this, uh, is this the, the greatest value for educational dollar, could simply not say, yes, it was, because it's not true. It, you have much less gain and much higher cost. So we set that aside. Final comparison is between scenarios A, B, and C. A is the existing scenario. Again, 23 facilities, 20 in scenarios B and C. There is slightly more building area maintained in scenarios B and C. The life cycle costs are slightly higher in B and C. The average educational adequacy is in the satisfactory range with B and C, and the cost-benefit ratio is quite a bit higher. And so to summarize, Scenarios B and C, um, whether, you, whether you prefer a three-phase or a four-phase, both provide these types of advantages. They meet our requirements for educational excellence. They create 21st century learning environments. Spaces, we mean by that, spaces designed to support modern educational programs. There are spaces which provide equitable learning environments across the district. That's incredibly important. In high-performance high educational environments, meaning environments that have those sorts of attributes that support the way students learn, proper humidity, proper temperature, daylight, those sorts of things, with lower student-teacher ratios. And they also provide educational excellence by incorporating the packed recommendations, the recommendations that have been developed through this series of meetings, recommended grade level configurations, facility sizes, and facility upgrades. On the other side of the coin, the educational efficiency side, they balance facility capacities with projected enrollments. They reduce the number of facilities to heat and cool and maintain. And there is a corresponding reduction in operating costs for lower um, staff required to administer and staff the facilities. And through high performance, energy efficient building renovations like geothermal building renovations. So to conclude, they provide a great cost benefit ratio. Um, for a cost over 30 years, which is only slightly higher than doing nothing, scenarios B and C can, sec can secure the educational future for the school district, which we believe is a great value for the citizens of the St. Joseph community. With that, we will turn the presentation over to Todd Gafoy of Piper Jaffrey, who will then talk about possible funding scenarios associated did I jump out of turn? All right. All right. All right. All right. As you can see, much information has been presented, and you'll have an opportunity to respond to that in one of your work studies. The very first task will be used to get a good input into the future of the
this aerial on the ring will advance the on the right again. For somebody that talks with their hands, now I've got both hands full, <clears throat> so I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Uh, last month, you may remember that we talked about the different options that a school district has to finance capital improvement projects. Uh, we kind of walked through what the legal debt capacity was. Uh, we had kind of a hypothetical example of what a tax increase might look like. And then I think finally we finished up with a little bit of information about bond ratings. Uh, last month, what we prepared really had no connection to any of the information that, that you've seen. It was just simply based on hypothetical information. Tonight, what we've done is taken the information that Sam has provided and tried to put that into uh, a framework from which you can see how the projects might be financed and ultimately what is the impact on the taxpayer. Again, at the top, you know, this is just conceptual. Uh, we're just trying to bring some focus into what the dollar amounts might be, uh, what the ultimate impact is going to be on the taxpayer and how the different phases come into play. Uh, obviously with scenario A that Sam talked about, we don't have numbers for that because that's already in place. And so what you see is scenario B and scenario C. With the scenario B, the three-phased approach, uh, again, hypothetically, we're showing bond issues in 2012, 2019, and then finally in 2029. Uh, each of those bond issues would require a levy increase in the debt levy. And so the first issue would be a 49 cent levy increase, followed by a 24 cent increase. And then finally the third issue would have a 13 cent increase associated with that uh, for a total of 86 cents. When you add that to the district's existing 30 cent levy, the debt levy would be somewhere around $1.16. Uh, 229, almost $230 million uh, is the dollar amount that Sam referenced, and that's the same under scenario B or C. Uh, when you jump over to scenario C, you can see the, the phases there is a four-phased approach, and what has been done there is with the $90 million issue in the first phase would have a 67 cent increase, so that's a little bit more than with scenario B, but you'll quickly notice that all of the subsequent phases, again, 2019, 2025, and 2029, would all be done without a tax increase. And so, uh, like many districts around the state, those issues could be presented to the voters as a no tax increase bond issue. The total levy over the four phases there is 67 cents. Uh, when you add that again to the 30 cents that's in place right now, the final levy would be about 97 cents. So it's a little bit less than what scenario B would be. Uh, if you go from uh, 67 cents and compare that to 86 cents, I think that's about a 28% increase uh, between the two, uh, between the two options. Again, what we've tried to do on this tax increase table is tie it to more uh, specific tax increase amounts. Last time I think we just talked in terms of a dime, but you can see here what a 49 cent, a 67 cent, and then ultimately an 86 cent levy increase, what that would mean to uh, a residential taxpayer. I'm not gonna go through that math, uh, but you can kind of look and see what the home values are. Uh, again, residential real estate is assessed at 19%. So for, if you have a $100,000 home times 19%, your assessed value would be $19,000, and then that's what your, your tax levy is based on. 